Okay, so Dr. Felice Lifshitz, thank you. So our board member, it's, it's, thank you so much for joining and for uh, teaching us today. And um, so the floor is yours and you'll lead us from here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you uh, for asking me to do this. It was a great learning opportunity for me as well. And thank you for coming, everybody who's here. Um, this will probably be somewhat awkward. Astonishingly, this is the first time I'm actually trying to do something like this. When um, the U of A suddenly went to remote learning in March because of COVID, um, I only tried to do synchronous discussions. I didn't do any synchronous lectures like this. I just put PowerPoints up on eClass. So this is the first time I'm attempting to share my screen, show you the stuff and, and lecture live. So that might be a little bit awkward, especially because I discovered this morning that when I click on the embedded links in the PowerPoint to take you to things, it's very distorted. So each time I wanna to go to something else, I'm gonna to have to stop sharing the PowerPoint, minimize that, go to my Chrome browser, and then show you the, the, the um, web page. So um, if that actually works, that'll just be wonderful. But this might be, this might be awkward, and I hope you'll bear with me, and I thank you for as much patience and forbearance as you can muster. Uh, queerly beloved, surpassing love in a Jewish context. I hope everybody can see my screen. I'm successfully sharing my screen. Yep, okay. Um, so obviously that main title there is a play on Dearly Beloved, We Are Gathered Here Today, which is a common opening for uh, um, various religious uh, ceremonies. Um, and uh, yeah, okay. So um, you can see that this phrase, Queerly Beloved, We Are Gathered Here To Gay, is also something that um, you can buy. Uh, it's commercially available on uh, products. Uh, and so I just wanted to have that phrase up as I go through um, some semantics, which are very likely not at all necessary, but just in case it's helpful you know, for, for anyone. I do think it's queerly beloved. Um, we are gathered here today is a wonderful phrase for these Pride Month uh, gatherings. It's really wonderful that many religious communities have taken to marking and celebrating Pride. Religious calendars do evolve all the time to include new important moments. And um, it's really wonderful that our community is embracing Pride Month as something worthy of special commemoration. Uh, so for the semantics, um, uh, most of the time I am going to use the term queer as an inclusive, inclusive single shorthand term that is supposed to include all the individual pieces in the formula LGBTQ2+, right? Lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, uh, queer, um, two-spirited, and the plus. And of course the plus, you know, stands for all the other possible permutations that people have um, uh, self-identified with explicitly in recent times, um, such as being um, being polyamorous or being asexual or aromantic, the possibilities for human sexuality beyond the hetero procreative are, are endless and all of those count as queer, right? So queer is anything that is not hetero procreative, but I recognize that when you use queer, you risk hiding all those individual pieces inside of it. On the other hand, if you just want to enumerate, you'll never be able to enumerate sufficiently to actually cover everything. You'll inevitably leave something else, something out. So that's why queer seems to be the best. It took a while for people to come to that. Um, all sorts of things were suggested over the years and are still used. Um, one that I find particularly interesting was Rebecca Alpert's Trans Lesbige, um, which is the terminology she used in her book, Like Bread on the Seder Plate from 1983, but that was before uh, queer became um, even reclaimed as a, as a word, um, uh, as, a, as a prideful term, as opposed to a slur term of abuse. 
Um, and then the, the other thing that I just want to point out before, you know, getting into it in case anybody hasn't ever, you know, thought all these things through, right? Queer can be a sexuality as like most of what I mentioned already, like being polyamorous or something, but it's also an identity, right? So it's an, it's a sexuality when it's, um, whom you go to bed with, but it's an identity when it's who you go to bed as. Right. So again, just in case, um, identities can be cis or trans. That is, they're cis when the um, sex or that you're assigned at birth matches what you yourself feel, and it's trans when um, the identity assigned at birth doesn't match what you yourself feel. And then you know there would be non-binary or gender non-conforming, which can be you know even more uh, complicated. So most of the time, I generally use queer, but um, as you will eventually see, I'm going to specifically focus more than anything on trans folks. Um, and so um, when, I, when I talk about that, I will, I will use trans. Most people with queer sexualities are cisgendered. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit first about sexuality. Um, so uh, even though I'm going to talk mostly about identity, so, you know, religious leaders, including Jewish ones, obviously, have put a lot of thought and effort into the regulation of sexuality over the centuries. And I'm illustrating that with a very famous graphic that is relevant to medieval Christian canon law from James Brundage's Law, Sex, and Christian Society in Medieval Europe. I'm using this because it's the only example of such a graphic that I know um, that um, kind of summarizes only for, you know, hetero procreative um, sex, um, all of the details and prohibitions that show up in medieval Christian canon law about when it's proper to have sex. And as you can see, uh, it's almost never permitted. Um, almost everything, you know, if it's Wednesday, for instance, you know, it's out, right? And if it's Saturday, it's out. Right, um, so the, I am not aware of anyone having made a chart like this um, from rabbinic responsa or halacha to give a sense of the kinds of complex regulation that has been going on out there um, over the centuries about, uh, about sexuality. Um, if anybody knows of one, I would love, I would love to find out about it. Um, but uh, even in the absence of seeing such a chart, I can say that um, in many ways there would be a lot of overlaps and, and similarities, especially in um, the kind of, you know, classic um, uh, um, support of heteroprocreative sex. Um, but I do also want to say that you see this whole chart is written completely from the perspective of heteroprocreative sex. And everything else is not even included or envisaged there. Um, and that's not because, that's not a fault of canon law. And I would say it's not also a fault of halacha. It's not that these things were not dealt with by religious leaders. It's a fault of the chart, right? The, those things were just left off the chart by, by Brundage, right? Um, so there, there's, there has been plenty of discussion and regulation uh, over the centuries about sexuality and a lot of it, uh, as I'm sure everybody already knows, um, is pretty anti-queer. Um, and anti-queer sexuality religious regulation frequently appeals to a few particular um, scriptural passages that are sometimes called clobber texts or clobber passages such as Leviticus 18.22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman, it is an abomination. And yeah, this is my first plan to try to go to a different, to a different thing here. Oh, I think that went smoothly, right? So just in case anybody is interested in what are the most famous clobber passages or clobber texts that are used. Um, here is um, the Dictionary of Christianese. 
uh, which is basically my specialty is much more Christianity, secondarily Islam, only tertiarily um, Judaism. But if you're interested in scriptural clobber passages, this is, um, this is good. Okay, so how do I go back to the, um, let's see how smoothly. Okay, now I just stopped sharing completely. <sighs> okay, so, oh, but um, that, that's all, you know, negative, and I don't want to do anything more in the, that kind of, you know, negative clobber vein. Uh, I'd particularly like to introduce everybody to this particular resource, Torah Queries, Weekly Commentaries on the Hebrew Bible, edited by Drinkwater, Lesser, and Schneer. Um, and this is really a wonderful, a wonderful little book. Um, it's 60 short and very accessible chapters that go through most of the passages of the Torah and find ways in which practically every word of the text speaks to queer experience in one way or another. And there are also chapters devoted to some major holidays. And uh, if you get that book, you look at chapters 28 to 30. Um, all of those uh, are explore ways to deal with those clobber passages. Okay. So um, all of that is about queerness as a sexuality. And my original intention was to focus on that aspect of queerness which is what I tried to evoke in the formulation of my subtitle, Surpassing Love um, in a Jewish Context. Uh, as we already saw this morning, um, the surpassing love is a verbal allusion or reference to a passage in the Hebrew Bible, one of the ones that comes up most frequently in connection with talking about queer, erotic, and affective relationships, and that is uh, concerning the relationship between David and Jonathan. Um, and you can see there, you know, in 2 Samuel 126, David laments Jonathan's death in battle and praises his love as surpassing the love of women. And I just put on there, you know, the cover of Lillian Federman's 1981 book uh, about romantic friendship and love between women um, that she titled Surpassing the Love of Men. I mean, this, this use of the phrase surpassing the love of and surpassing love is... Um, uh, really kind of built into discussions of queer sexuality. Um, but as I, as I already said, um, even though this my, my first instinct was to focus on the sexuality angle of queerness, in the end, I decided to focus instead on the identity angle of queerness um, with the issue of trans lives in Jewish communities. So my subtitle is actually misleading, and I'm sorry. Um, but um, I only came to this, um, this idea of focusing on trans people uh, after sending in my title. Um, when I realized that what really seemed important to do right now uh, was to fully honor the people who got the ball rolling on having pride celebrations in the first place. Uh, so um, for anyone who's not familiar with the history, um, the origins of of the Pride celebrations go back to the Stonewall in Rebellion in New York City on June 29th, 1969. Um, that um, was a point at which the, um, the patrons of a particular bar in Greenwich Village in New York City uh, finally got fed up with um, police harassment, police brutality, police you know, beating them up and shaking them down for money not to beat them up, you know, night after night and year after year and, and rebelled. And so at this moment right now, in terms of um, what's going on about thinking about uh, trying to finally try to do something about the lawlessness of, the, of law enforcement, um, it seems particularly apt to remember the origins of pride in that, in that rebellion. Um, and so the rebellion was 69. The first actual pride parade was the, a year le later in 1970 on, um, on Christopher Street. But that was not the beginning of the queer civil rights movement um, by a long shot. And I wanted now also to show you 
can see here, if I click on this, actions before Stonewall, it's not going to work. It's going to get all messy. So instead, I have to do, okay. okay. Oh, but it won't let me, okay, here, there. Okay, so um, you can see here, this is one of the, you know, a lot of people are like super down on Wikipedia and there is a hell of a lot that's wrong with Wikipedia, no question about it. Um, but, you know, individual articles um, are sometimes extremely valuable. And this is one that is, um, that lists some specific um, actions connected with the queer civil rights movement, uh, at least just in the United States alone. I mean, there's other things earlier and there's just other things elsewhere, but just to have a larger uh, context for this. And the most important one of all of these uh, previous um, or pre-Stonewall issues um, were a series of um, actions around Compton's cafeteria in San Francisco. Um, and, you know, if you look through this, you'll see um, a bunch of those. So now I'm going to go back to this. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. So the Compton's Cafeteria riot in 1966, right? And there's the commemorative plaque for that. Here marks the site of Jean Compton's Cafeteria where a riot took place one August night when transgender women and gay men stood up for their rights and fought against police brutality, poverty, oppression, and discrimination in the Tenderloin. Um, and here uh, is a the photograph, the central photograph shows some of the trans women of color who were involved. And um, the ultimate point is this, that trans women of color were absolutely central to all of these actions, to the Stonewall riots and to the Compton's cafeteria riots or rebellions, although they were ignored for a long time. And so what I decided this week was that they absolutely completely deserve the spotlight given what's um, happening right now, um, rather than do a real like, you know, cis white um, queer Jonathan and David thing. So um, what we should make sure that we do, at least this year during Pride is um, honor and remember the trans women of color to whom we owe the Stonewall Rebellion that's at the root of pride. Um, that's above all the Puerto Rican trans liberation activist, Sylvia Rivera and um, Marsha Pay It No Mind Johnson. And you can see here images um, of the two of them, one made in 2013 and one made in 2019 um, by Mika Bazant. Um, Mika Bazant, as you can see there, is a trans visual artist who works with social justice movements to reimagine the world. They create art inspired by struggles to decolonize ourselves from white supremacy, patriarchy, ableism, and the gender binary. Mika is a white anti-Zionist Jew and identifies as trans, non-binary, and timtum, one of six traditional Jewish gender categories. Right. Um, so one more time to the internet. One more time to the internet. Is this, um, is this really, um, is this relatively smooth, this going back and forth? Here, ah, it won't let me get under. It won't let me get under, okay. Okay, so can you see um, Rabbi Daniel Rutenberg's Twitter thread there? Yes, uh, I, I can see it. Yes, okay, thank you. Um, so um, this was something that was touched upon this morning as well and um, that I didn't um, 
I didn't really want to go into in any depth, in part because I'm wildly not um, uh, an expert on, on all of this, um, but of all the different gender um, statuses and categories that um, have shown up in Jewish um, commentary and scholarship um, over the centuries. But um, I did like um, Rabbi Rutenberg's um, particular formulation about Timtum as a person whose gender status and identity appears to be shape shifty, right? Sometimes a man and sometimes a woman. I saw other things about like genitals hidden under flaps or you know strange things and uh, I shouldn't say strange, never say strange, but you know just uh, um, this one seemed the most generally useful <laughs> just shape shifty. I liked her her notion of Tim Tum um, that way, right? Um, so um, my goal here is to center trans Jews, no, no, trans women of color, the trans women of color who were so central to uh, jumpstarting pride. Um, and I was very pleased to discover that Mika Bazant um, has made these beautiful posters, which can even be purchased um, from their website um, of them, right? Um, and so speaking of uh, Jewish Pride Month celebrations of, um, of this history, I wanted to, okay, why isn't it going forward? Okay. Okay, yes. Okay, so um, I want to call out slash call in Keshet, which was mentioned many times um, this morning already as a source of um, good information and a lot of great resources for thinking about um, um, the queer uh, Jewish experience. Um, and the organization Keshet, um, their mission is for LGBTQ equality in Jewish life. And they say lots of things like we equip Jewish organizations with the skills and knowledge to build LGBTQ affirming communities, create spaces, spaces in which all queer Jewish youth feel seen and valued and advance LGBTQ rights nationwide. Um, and their, their website is also up in my browser, but I don't know if I'll, you know, I'll just, if I'll bother to go to it. It's, you know, keshetonline.org. There's all sorts of things up there and they have a drop down menu. Um, I mean, they're based in the United States, especially in Boston with various branch offices. And there's, there's all sorts of things up there. They even have a drop down menu to select conservative, orthodox, reform, reconstructionist or renewal as your movement. So they're really trying to provide resources for everyone. And there's a lot up there. A lot of things are really good. Like for instance, this uh, 2019 uh, none are free until all are free, a Seder ritual about the struggle for civil rights of same-sex couples. Um, and 2017 is a complete Shabbat, pride-themed, right? You can see it there. Um, but my, my, the slight thing I want to kind of, you know, call out is the, um, the thing they just put up, um, or that Maya Brodke just put up on June 12, 2020, Uprising and Identity, a Jewish Exploration of LGBTQ Pride. Um, the, it's approximately 75 minutes long and uh, it includes step-by-step -step directions for doing, I guess, what, what we're doing here today. Um, and she suggests things like comparing Stonewall to notable uprisings in Jewish history, such as the Hanukkah story or Purim or the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. I mean, there's all sorts of good things there, but the, the thing that I want to explicitly criticize, because that's just the kind of gal I am, um, is that Brodke doesn't even come close to recognizing Rivera and Johnson as the people who are the, um, the prime movers of the entire pride uh, movement, right? The most that she says, this is the most that she says, the closest she comes to acknowledging their centrality is it's rumored that a trans woman threw her high heeled shoe at an officer, which acted as a catalyst for further agitation. Um, and that really deeply minimizes and hides um, both the centrality of trans 
women and the centrality of trans women of color. It was almost all um, trans people of color and drag queens that night and at Compton's. And especially again in this moment of Black Lives Matter and everything, we oh, should not. Hello? Sumi, can I call you back? I'm on Zoom. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, especially in this moment, it, it seems that um, we should make every effort to recognize and not hide um, people of color and especially trans people of color on um, in Pride Month. Okay, now not that anybody is quote unquote of color here, but I just thought before we go into the heavy duty texts, we just point out um, a couple of examples in which trans folks have been really front and center in relation to Jewish experience. Uh, I don't know how many people watched Transparent, the TV show that was on um, from 2014 to 2019, directed by Jill Soloway, uh, which followed a Jewish family through generations of trans and trans curious and trans adjacent um, queer lives as they moved between Germany and the USA and Israel uh, over almost a century of time. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to bring this up is because if you, you may have seen the show but not have known about the quote unquote historicity of um, the, the um, place where, um, where Gittel, um, the, uh, the trans, you know, from, what do I say, great aunt of the main character, of the main trans character, um, was um, spending most of her time at the um, Institute for Sexual Science, the Institute for Sexual, Sexual Wissenschaft in Berlin, uh, which was run by um, this, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this man, Magnus Hirschfeld, um, uh, and he was uh, a major uh, figure in the far long pro, you know, pre Stonewall history of, of queer civil rights starting even in the 19th century. There's a huge movement in Germany for queer civil rights. Um, and this, uh, this clinic or institute um, that shows up in, um, in Transparent uh, was also the place at which the very first ever gender um, confirmation surgery was performed. And it was Hirschfeld um, who did that. So um, this, was, this was a show that was completely Jewish with a rabbi as a key character and bar mitzvahs and all sorts of things, Jewish weddings, uh, trips to Israel. Um, so if anybody hasn't seen it, um, I don't know, I, I recommend it. Not the last season, that was terrible. But um, the, that's pretty interesting. And then also, I would, um, and, I, and if you have seen it or not, just to know that that's like a real and important and serious place uh, where Gittel is in Berlin. And then also just um, calling to your attention, if you haven't thought about it in a while, Yentl, based on that Isaac Bastavis, um singer's story, Yentl, the Yeshiva boy. Um, where um, a uh, person who is uh, assigned female at birth lives as, uh, lives as a male. Uh, in um, Bashevis Singer's story, the, the ending is tragic because um, Yentl never really fits in anywhere, but um, Barbara Streisand's movie um, from 1983, um, does, um, does treat Yentl's defiance of expectation as a, as a liberation. But one of the things that I want to say about figures such as Yentl the yeshiva boy um, is to underline how differently people, at least scholars, but probably people in general, um, but I, yeah. Uh, interact so much more with scholars than people in general, um, how, how much they have been rethinking 
figures like Yentl and other historical figures, actual real historical figures, not characters in, in fictional short stories, but there are a number of, large number of documented historical figures who have been understood for a long time um, when scholars did or historians did start paying attention to these kinds of things at all as transvestites, right? As people who were, you know, just changing their clothes or, or masquerading somehow, right? Um, and there's recently been a rethinking about people who have been labeled retrospectively or retroactively as transvestites as maybe transsexual, right, as, or transgender, as fully trans. And that's one of the reasons why I try to always use trans asterisk, right, um, because it never is really clear, like, how trans, trans in what way, in what way do they self-understand themselves to be trans, and that's something it's not always easy to get at. In fact, it's generally extremely difficult to get at uh, if you go back in time, and because I am a late ancient early medieval specialist, which means mostly like the eighth century, um, it's really about like, you can't, <laughs> you can't know for sure. Okay, but that's, that's the fun stuff. And now just have some, uh, some serious um, text, right? Um, so, um, queer, is a sexuality and it's an identity, but it's also an interpretive approach. And most of the rest of this is just long quotations from serious scholarship about how to read scripture through, um, through a queer lens and what does queer mean or norm critical which is another, you know, more scholarly term for, for queer, um, mean as an interpretive approach um, for um, looking at scripture, um, not just the, the Torah. Uh, and so uh, I thought that perhaps uh, if other people are interested uh, in reading some of these long passages, um, so that it's not just always me talking. Um, and I think these are all things that you can ponder as they, you hear them go by and hopefully they'll spur your insights about thinking about how you understand or interact with scripture. But I'm just wondering if anybody um, else would like to read some of these um, passages, all of which I've given, you know, I've given you the general citation, but I was lazy and give, didn't give the particular page citation, but I couldn't always do that because sometimes if you see the four dot dot dots, that's because I left out a bunch anyway. So um, anybody else want to read or should I just, just read? Okay, well, maybe everybody's just even gone. So <laughs> I'll just read and at least we will uh, record this and it will exist that way. Right. So David Tab Stewart um, notes that norm criticism, when we apply that to scripture, leads to viewing biblical characters in all their variety, including different bodily characteristics, physical and mental abilities, and personal character traits. Uh, Ellen T. Armour goes further to queer is to complicate, to disrupt, to disturb all kinds of orthodoxies, to destabilize dominant conceptions of what the Bible says. In some queer interpretation of the Bible, collects interpretations and questions rather than reducing interpretations to a singular correct answer. It interrogates, looks for non heteronormative and the gender fluid, resists heteronormativity and questions boundaries and categories strains toward privileging uniqueness. It is anti-essentialist, that is not generalizing. Resists academic norms by making room for playfulness and humor, both camp and drag, and eschews the single definition of queer. And so is a collection of family resemblances, saving spaces for the queer not yet thought of and the queer to come, right? So, Often, 
reading through a queer lens in that way has led to the argument or to the conclusion that the Torah and the God of and God in the Torah is already absolutely queer and queer in ways that completely support the dignity and humanity of trans people. So here um, are some strung together quotations from a professor of English at Yeshiva University and a trans woman, um, Joy Ladin. Um, and again, I would just ask if anybody else is interested in um, reading or if I should just read this passage. I'm happy to read. Thank you. So let you rest for a moment. It gets very tiring. I know to talk so much. Okay. So Torah's God is disembodied, incomparable, and incomprehensible in human terms. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam developed theologies based on the God we encounter in the Torah. But by Iron Age standards, this God is utterly queer. Later Jewish traditions and texts normalized this queer God, imagining God as a king or emperor surrounded by an angelic court. But the God we encounter in the five books of Moshe has no normalizing context, no divine hierarchy to define God's kinship, no divine family for God to patriarchically dominate, no consort, no body. As a result, despite the masculine pronouns and verb forms assigned by the text, God has no gender, masculine or otherwise, because God has no way to demonstrate or perform a gender. Gender is a system. Even in the simplest form of that system, the gender, gender binary requires at least two of a kind, and God, as Jews affirm in the Shema prayer, is one. And as many of us know, being singular, living outside recognized human categories and relationships, makes one very queer indeed. The emphasis on sacred normativity in Judaism and the Jewish community harms those like LGBTQ Jews who don't fit established norms. It also harms the Torah by obscuring the queerness on which its moral and spiritual vitality depend. Torah doesn't traffic in binary thinking. God is one. Simultaneously, the ordainer of sacred norms and, ab and absolutely queer beyond human con conception. We are queer children of a queer God, and by we, I mean the Jewish people. When queer Jews read Torah as our own, we help all Jews recognize and reclaim our heritage of radical queerness, rekindling the flame of desire that led our ancestors to abandon known norms and follow God through a wilderness unsown toward a future founded on the principle that being true to God requires being true to ourselves. For the Torah's queerness to be recognized as a vital part of Judaism and Jewish identity, as a crucial component, complement, and counterweight to the Torah's emphasis on sacred norms, the Torah needs us each queer Jew with our innumerable differences and disagreements to take Torah personally, to read our lives in light of the Torah and read the Torah in light. I don't have the rest. In light of our lives. Of our lives. That's okay. it. Thank you. Okay, yes, thank you. This is a beautiful thank text. You. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I really liked it. And thank you so much for reading it. Yeah, this whole, uh, this whole article is really great. Um, and so then I thought, you know, having once made this general assertion that um, the God of the Torah is queer and the Torah is queer, we had some very few select passages. Um, Torah and of course, beginning at the beginning. Uh, and uh, I acknowledge that um, you, Rabbi, and Lauren, and I'm sure many other people um, gathered here understand this material better than I do, having flunked out of Hebrew school and being, again, a specialist mostly in Christianity and Islam. Um, but here is, um, you know, you begin at the beginning, you know, with the creation, in case anybody has not ever, you know, pondered this. Uh, I did take both the English translation and the Hebrew off of um, Keshet. Um, and, um, you know, so this is the translation. I believe this Reuben Zelman, Rabbi Zelman, is the person mentioned before by Lauren uh, as the first um, trans person admitted to the Hebrew Union College. Um, What's important about this or interesting for me here is not just the text itself, um, 
but also, and uh, the fact that all of the commentators on the verse, and you can see there the emphasis is mine, right? Um, over the centuries, all commentators on the verse in you know, Jewish tradition have agreed that all human beings, and we already heard this this morning, are essentially created in the image of God, uh, whether male, female, intersex, or something else. Um, and how commentators from ancient times to the present day have uh, considered the possibility that um, God's first human creation was male, bi-gender, intersex, non-gendered, lots of different things. Apparently, the only thing that was never on the table was female, but that's for a different talk. Um, and um, our verse teaches that all human beings are created Elohim in the divine image. So, what does that also mean about you know God? So, you know. God, God is also uh, queer and complicated. And then I just took one um, set of their, um, their commentaries to show you because it comes from my period. Um, the, the text of Genesis or Bereshit, uh, as far as I understand it, um, perhaps um, the, the rabbi knows a different, more up-to-date or uh, dating is the text itself of the scriptures probably dates from around the eighth century um, BC. But um, what I wanna show you are a few um, excerpts from a commentary on Genesis um, or Bereshit, the Genesis Rabbah, um, all book eight, chapter one. Um, and, um, the, the Genesis Rabbah um, comes from approximately 400 of the Common Era, right? Um, and so that's, that's my period. Um, so um, Kukla and Zelman provide some examples of rabbinic exegesis in the Genesis Rabbah, that all of which shows how rabbinic exegetical transition, uh, tradition is trans-inclusionary. Right, so here are, you know, a few of the different um, possibilities um, that according to Rabbi Yermia ben Elazar, God created the first human, both male and female at the same time, a single bi-gendered being known as the androgynos. He understands the androgynos as the singular bi-gendered being referred to in the first half of the verse and men and women as the multiple beings referred to in the second half of the verse. Um, so that was one possibility for trying to understand uh, the original humanity and how humanity is created in, in the image of God. Another one is um, Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachman's uh, idea that God created the first human as one body with two fronts and no back, and then God split the two fronts apart and added a back side to each, creating two separate humans, one male and one female. Um, and then one that I find especially fascinating um, is that according to Rabbi Tantuma, when the Blessed Holy One created the first Adam, God created him as a golem, and it was extended from one end of the world to its other end. A golem is a formless and infinite mass. Such a creature would have neither a discernible sex nor even a defined physical form and would be entirely genderless. This description of the first human as a golem aligns with the idea of God as limit, limitless, omnipresent, and beyond human description. So that is how the Adam was created in the image of God. Um, so um, that's three rabbinic interpretations from around 400 of the common era. But um, obviously, not obviously, but contemporary queer exegesis moves in similar directions and is unsurprisingly even more completely and explicitly affirmative about trans identities. So for instance, Rachel Biale and her chapter um, from Torah queries, Trans and Trans at Har Sinai, um, she argues that the gender fluidity manifested in intersex people at birth and in transgender people later is embodied in the creation of the first human. For her, the text itself poses the idea that the first most perfect human being who was a direct embodiment of God was a hermaphrodite and seems to suggest that trans or intersexuality may be the ultimate state of human and divine perfection. Wow. Wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that good? Isn't that great? Yeah. The 
Barry's book is really good. It's really a great collection. I mean, I just could have like, you know, gone through, you know, everything, right, for every day, right? Um, so, so using Torah queries and other scholarships, some of which I've already cited and some of which I have not been able to work in, it would be possible to go step by step through the entire Torah to suggest trans-inclusive and trans-affirmative ways of understanding sacred scripture. And I just wanted to give two more examples, one still about the Torah and the other about a major holiday. There's no way to just do it, you know, exhaustively or comprehensively. But the two examples, the two, you know, further examples that I have um, are held together by a common understanding of the central place of queerness in Judaism, right? The idea that, that the, God, the, the God of Judaism is queer and the Torah is queer, right? Um, and key moments such as Abraham's initial experience of God um, can be understood through the, um, the queer lens uh, as queer, right? Or maybe even, or maybe has to be understood that way. And the Passover can under, be stood in that way too. Um, so here we have another quote from, um, from Laden um, about um, the Torah. If anybody else would like to read about this moment. I'll read for you. Thank you. In Hebrew, God's first words to Abraham, the words from which the Jewish people will grow are lech lecha, which can be understood as go to yourself or according to Hasidic tradition, go to the root of your being. Abraham has spent 75 years living in his father's house, being his father's son. To respond to this queer nameless God who appears in none of the pantheons, rituals, myths, or histories Abraham would have known, Abraham has to queer himself, to estrange himself from his father, his heritage, his culture, and everything that has to this point defined him and follow God towards a nameless place, the land that I will show you. That represents an incomprehensible future. Right, thank you, thank you so much, right? So this, this fundamental you know, moment of connection between Abraham and God is one that, that requires Abraham to become queer, right? So that is a very affirmative way of understanding um, queerness in the Jewish tradition. And then there's one more, even longer quote from the Torah queries chapter about um, uh, Passover for trans Jews and what Passover can mean for trans Jews, right? Um, and this is um, uh, really something that, uh, I mean, it's too bad we're not doing this around Passover, but then Pride and Passover are different times of the year. But we all know that we always try to update um, our Passover stories to recognize current struggles. And this is something that really, you know, could be included um, in Seders to change and enrich them to um, include um, this uh, as one of the understandings of, of what's going on there um, to um, outright affirm uh, the identity of trans Jews. Um, you know, and I think, you know, Paula, by asking for references from before, you know, you were, you were basically alluding to that idea that we can include a lot of these things just going forward, maybe um, a lot of the time. It doesn't, they don't have to only show up um, on Pride Month, you know, they can show up as part of Passover. But um, if anybody would be interested in reading this discussion of what Passover means for or might mean for trans Jews or how um, cis Jews can even understand Passover better by um, taking inspiration from um, tra uh, a trans lens. If anybody would like to read, I would love to invite you to do so. I can read. Thank you. The Passover Haggadah reminds us that in every generation, all Jews are obligated to see themselves as if they had personally left Egypt. Jews know Egypt. Jews in every generation have too often experienced Egypt or Mitzrayim, narrow places in which they have been enslaved physically or metaphorically, 
and silenced for being who they are. Gay, lesbian, and bisexual Jews are particularly well suited to fulfill the commandment to remember and personally identify with the experience of the Exodus. For everyone who has left the closet has known Egypt and has left Egypt in his or her lifetime. But what if Mitzrayim was not a place or not even a set of expectations or societal norms or religious prohibitions or legal limitations? What if Mitzrayim was your own body? And every time you looked at your reflection, every time someone called you by your name, you knew that you were imprisoned, enslaved in a body that was not your home. What if like the generations of Israelites born in Egypt, you were born into that narrow place? And even though you had never known anything else, you knew in your heart of hearts that you did not belong there. For so many transgender people, that is the experience of the world. Every day they are called by names that do not describe them and dressed in clothing that feels foreign to them. Forced by birth or by society to inhabit a body that does not belong to them, they must move through the world betraying their knowledge of themselves or transgressing their definitions and roles of male and female that this culture holds so sacred. The journey of a transgender person like the journey of the children of Israel involves leaving everything known for the promise of something completely unknown. Their lives depend on their leaving. Leaving is terrifying, even if what is being left, the place that is known, is Mitzrayim. The time for liberation has more than come. Still, even when they are ready, they still must contend with Pharaoh, who does not want to let them go. The Pharaoh of the progressive world that is still deeply attached to binary notions of gender. The Pharaoh of gay and lesbian communities that still do not embrace transgender people and transgender rights as an essential element of queer identity, queer activism and queer community. The Pharaoh of fear, the Pharaoh of the body, there is no shortage of Pharaoh. Thank you. So, um, the, the argument here from a lot of these um, texts that I've been reading um, is that um, Jewish communities have to really go beyond simple, you know, inclusion of queer and trans um, identities and experiences to outright affirmation. And that the only way to do that is really to, to queer and transform queer um, rituals and prayers to make up new ones or modify old ones. Um, to be, as I said, truly affirmative and not just inclusive, because inclusion can mean just being simply tolerant of the presence of queer or trans Jews, but it doesn't require any changes of um, normative practices and can still end up feeling very uh, unfriendly um, to queer and trans Jews uh, a lot of the time. Um, so yeah, right, so inclusion is assimilationist and normative and doesn't require, require Judaism to alter the structures that render it hostile towards queer people in the first place. But affirmation seeks to include queer people in Jewish communities and also find value in the presence and gifts of queer Jews. So I've been selecting passages that show how um, even um, people who are, you know, not in any way queer themselves can come to understand Torah um, more deeply through um, using or benefiting from the queer eye, right? On it. I've never seen that show, either the old one or the new one, but I think that's uh, basically what that's about. We have a real chance to do something different here. And um, the only particular um, ritual or queering of a normative rich Jewish ritual that uh, I wanted to call your attention to is the Queer Mikvah Project, what um, some people are doing with, um, with mikvahs, right? They're reclaiming the mikvah to affirm trans identity. I, I suppose people probably know that the mikvah is traditionally used to cleanse the female body after menstruation, but for trans Jews, the mikvah is used to cleanse their bodies of the toxicity of hetero and cis normativity. I mean, in that way, it's not only 
um, a queer mikvah ritual is not only affirmative, but it's also reparative and healing for trans Jews who choose to undergo that ritual. And I will do one more. Uh, yeah. See, I will show you this website. Oh, there's the, okay, we'll get rid of Dania. That's the cachette site. I didn't go to that, but here, the queer, the queer mikvah project has a variety, a variety of different kinds of rituals that's all organized around water, obviously. Um, and they're not all necessarily particularly Jewish or anything, but if anybody wants to look more, um, more into this, it's, I think, a pretty good example of some of the ways in which we have the opportunity here to create um, new and truly affirmative rituals. Now, I was struggling with whether I should just end on that or also do one more thing. I have one more slide, because I did thought, think maybe I should look a little bit into the world of so-called orthodox um, or traditional Judaism. Everything I've been talking about is um, a cons at least conservative and really um, pretty reformed, um, but I did want to just say a little bit, very little bit, just one slide, about the fact, and this is something I learned completely brand new, um, about the fact that um, even the so-called Orthodox are um, grappling with the questions, right? Um, and for, for them, it is, uh, much more of an intellectual puzzle, um, though I feel bad talking about anyone's actual existence as an intellectual puzzle. Um, but um, the so-called Orthodox, um, Orthodox Jews, as many of you I'm sure know, uh, basically have, um, have the gender binary as an organizing religious principle, right? Uh, so, it's very, very difficult. It's much more difficult to deal with actual daily life, uh, given that. So there were a couple of interesting uh, chapters in this book edited by Slimovich and Feit on homosexuality, transsexuality, psychoanalysis, and traditional Judaism um, about this. And so um, one of the contributions was by Ariel Poveda, um, exploring the experiences of the really very few trans Jews who do manage to stay in touch with um, Orthodox Judaism. Uh, and, you know, you can just imagine, or you don't have to imagine because uh, Paveda goes through um, the, the complications of this, for example, how hard it is to negotiate um, the daily obligation to say a morning prayer that is different for men and for women, and that in the case of a man, blesses God for not having made him a woman, right? So imagine how hard that would be or how that would work for either a trans man or a trans woman. But the surprise ending of Paveda's chapter um, is that um, before and during transition, uh, so-called orthodox gender binary structures are terrible. Right, and um, they they can cause so many problems, and most um, trans and gender nonconforming um, Jews just have to flee the whole um, structure, the whole community. But this is the surprise ending. Apparently, post transition, and this is based on interviews and studies with trans Jews who are currently practicing in Orthodox communities, if they can pass right, um, as um, cis, even though they're trans, if people can't clock that they have transitioned, the very strict um, gender binary turns out to be very supportive and very helpful, um, at least based on these, um, these interviews. Once the, the dysphoria and the mismatched body and obligations, you know, go away, um, apparently, it's 
quite satisfying for the um, trans Orthodox Jews that he, um, that he interviewed. Um, they'll always have little problems, um, like a trans woman who habitually participates allowed in saying the blessing over wine at table, but only men are supposed to do that. So now she has to remember to be quiet. So it's always kind of hard, but, but still the presence of strict rules apparently are um, helpful. So here's his quote, his, uh, um, or her, I don't know, I don't know about Oriel Poveda, so I'll just say they maybe. Um, here's their conclusion. The gendered religious practices of Orthodox Judaism had the potential to become an obstacle during growing up. After their transition, however, gendered religious practices could become a valuable resource for affirmation and cosmic validation. Um, and, you know, that was nice to see. And one other article the, that I found interesting was by Hillel Gray um, on the halacha around gender confirmation surgery. Um, there are trans sympathetic rabbis who have said that genital surgery can be justified under Jewish law in cases where gender dysphoria is deemed life threatening. And this is the same sort of thing we heard discussed this morning about how, you know, human dignity uh, can trump even negative principles in, in Torah. Um, so that's, that's good, that's progressive, but apparently still, at least as of the writing of this book or as of the contributors to this book, there is a general principle that halachic gender cannot be changed. So you can have gender confirmation surgery or as the contributors of this book call it gender reassignment surgery, which is a different way of conceptualizing it. You can have that surgery, but halachically your gender can never change. Um, so there's always going to be complex negotiations and one really uh, evocative um, example of the ways in which these complications will always remain under um, um, so-called orthodox halakha is that if you have um, a burial in a cemetery in which there are separate rows for men and women, uh, a trans woman will have a male halachic status and that body will always trouble the grave sites of the neighboring um, uh, bodies, right? And that will be very distressing. So that's, yeah. Um, but Hillel Gray still thinks that in the future there's gonna be a greater orthodox discourse also on transgender um, and that they're, uh, they will grapple with this more and at least in more sympathetic, if not affirmative, ways. Um, and one thing that maybe could really make a big difference um, is perhaps the experience or the book here by Abby Stein, the author of Becoming Eve, My Journey from Ultra-Orthodox Rabbi to Gen Transgender Woman. Um, Abby Stein, for those of you who haven't heard of her, is a direct descendant of the Baal Shem Tov, the 18th century Polish mystic and healer who is regarded as the founder of Hasidic Judaism. So she was born in 1991 and had a bar mitzvah and entered an arranged marriage and had a son and became a rabbi and then left the community in 2012 and came out as trans in 2015. So um, we can see what might come um, of, of her book uh, and her experience in the Hasidic community. But um, that's it. And thank you much. For, thank you very much for your attention. And I'm going to escape and stop sharing my screen. Okay. Thank you, Felice. That was most enlightening. Oh, thank you. Hi, Miriam. Great to see you. Shabbat shalom, dear. I have to leave now. Okay.